What if I told you that I've never actually gotten into Dark Souls? I mean, I have played it, but only for a bit. Not enough for it to count, I'd say. It's not like I have any kind of excuse or anything. This widely available, widely praised game that's been around for more than 10 years has become such a monumental discussion topic for the medium. It's been considered a rite of passage for gamers to prove their resolve and skill. Out of all of the difficult games that have released over the years, Dark Souls is the capstone, the crown jewel of them all. It's THE difficult game. At least, that's what the internet told me. While I've had experience with both the demons that spawned it and the blood born from it, Dark Souls was a game that I never really approached, at least not with the same drive. But also, I never said to myself, I will never play Dark Souls. Something, whatever that might be, always kept that title on the table. I never pushed it aside for good. But even with all that I did hear about Dark Souls, I knew very little about the world. I could parse together some ideas from my time playing Demon Souls or Bloodborne, but this game's enormous presence in the culture left an unfamiliar mark. What the hell is Anne Orlando? Why is everyone talking about this Blight Town place? Why are we praising the sun so damn much? So many questions, so many bits of lore and in-jokes existed surrounding this game, and in all honesty, that is one reason why I wanted to invest myself in this game. I wanted to see what all the fuss is about. Why do people like Dark Souls? And I didn't know. I felt like the guy in the crowd who didn't get the reference. In reflection, I took a long hard look at just how omnipresent this game is. With so many videos and channels covering Dark Souls, I feared that there was absolutely nothing that I could contribute to the conversation. It's come up a lot in the past, but I don't really like discussing a game unless there's something new I can offer, a view that hasn't been repeated and done to death already. Going into this, I was hesitant to say anything. I can't analyze Dark Souls' detailed lore, deeply contemplate its mechanics, map out its intricate level design. What can someone like me, someone who has never actually given this game a full, honest look, what can I say that hasn't been said already? Well, I'm not sure if it's going to hold any water here, but Dark Souls has existed for more than 10 years now, and I haven't gotten into it until 2022. Maybe that's the unique perspective I can provide. Maybe my first time really exploring Dark Souls is the part that can't be repeated or duplicated. This is my journey. Playing a game that's megalithic in its presence and seeing what finishing that massive entity can really say about me as a video game fan. This is my first time in Dark Souls. Something I noticed almost immediately after controlling my character was the stiff movement in attacking. In a time when so many action games were about fast and responsive mobility animations, Dark Souls, much like Demon's Souls, puts a lot of weight behind the attacks. These can obviously be tweaked with various armor and stat builds, but without a second thought, I wanted to be able to move around any encounter quicker than initially available. But even with a more mobile build, Dark Souls mechanics are still very rigid. It reminded me of the early Castlevania games, in fact, where every move you make had the sense of risk-reward to it. You definitely had to plan around your own lack of fluidity in those games, and these games, especially Demon's Souls and Dark Souls, follow the same mantra. Every move you make in Dark Souls has an element of commitment behind it, a split-second decision-making that feels more contemplative and tactical than the action games that have faster, more fluid combat. Knowing the battlefield is just as important too, since taking advantage of cover or distance can give you a chance to attack, reposition, or heal. The tension behind having just enough time to take a drink of Estus and roll away to avoid a heavy hit is unbelievable, constantly reinforcing the commitment needed to make any kind of move. It took a lot of adjustment of muscle memory to swim with the flow of Dark Souls River, but the number of options that the game gives you keeps things from feeling restrictive enough to flat out bar progress. For example, while my early hours had me in full armor kit, the Platinum Games fan in me decided to abandon that and stick to a build with limited armor and fast rolling. Starting with a sword, I eventually moved to a halberd because I've always been a fan of melee weapons that have a bit more range behind them, and the thrusting attack allowed me to plan out positioning in a fitting way. I love the variety of weapon and build types in Dark Souls. The encouragement to experiment fit my preference and showed me right off the bat that there was plenty of depth behind the light and heavy attack patterns. Sure, this isn't anything unique to Dark Souls, but it's subtle enough to be rewarding to discover, and valuable enough to structure a skeleton of meaningful, commitment-driven mechanics. I did a bit of soul farming in my lead up to the Taurus Demon boss, but my early deaths with the mobs of enemies were a reminder of Dark Souls' intense sense of oppression. 
The Undead Burg was interesting to experience. Enemies do swarm in numbers every now and then, yes, but even a single enemy can prove a challenge to defeat based on where it's placed. Exploring Dark Souls is less trial and error and more an encouragement of trepidation and resilient caution. Running blindly into battle for the first time is a death knell because enemies are very conscientiously placed. Ambushes from around corners, projectile attacks from snipers and bomb tossers, multiple enemies that can poison you over time. Dark Souls manages to make even the rudimentary locations feel thoughtful. That sense of purpose definitely reached a high point when I discovered an early shortcut from the bonfire to the section after the Taurus demon. I do know that one major appeal point for Dark Souls from fans has been its interconnectivity. Those little passages that link major landmarks and regions together, especially after long and arduous treks through winding and spiraling paths, show that the entire layout of Dark Souls has a shocking amount of consideration behind it. Despite Dark Souls' density, it's not a particularly large world to explore, and that definitely gave the developers the space needed to give each location's layout some deep thought. You could say that From Software were being rebellious not just in making a tough-as-nails retro throwback, but in a game where every bit was given the thoughtfulness needed to make it fit perfectly. Those shortcuts aren't just convenient ways to return to points of reprieve, they show Dark Souls' design consideration pristinely. By the time I made my way to the Bell Gargoyle fight, I was already getting a bit weary. I understood the game's notorious difficulty, but I did hit a wall at that particular fight. At first, I figured that I could brute force my way through, rolling past wild hitboxes and frenetically chugging Estes just to stay alive for a few more seconds. But the Bell Gargoyle didn't hold back, wildly swinging its weapon as I desperately tried to roll without falling off. The arrival of the second Gargoyle halfway through the fight left me stunned, but also laughing a bit. Dropping a second boss enemy right when you're making progress with the first is comically evil, the kind of nasty surprise that made Dark Souls kind of hard to get mad at. It was almost admirable in its commitment to making its world so oppressive and dangerous. In a way, I can appreciate that dedication to its creative goal, constantly keeping the player on their toes and hammering down the idea that this game will test your limits. I didn't want to adjust my strategy with the Bell Gargoyles. I wanted to just keep trying and prove to myself that this was something I could plow through. Eventually. But through hours of work, I eventually caved and spent time upgrading my gear instead, farming a few souls and leveling up in the process. It was a concession at first, saying to me that pure unfettered twitch skills weren't enough to press onward and ring that bell. And to an extent, it was. You can easily make the case that this was cheesing the boss, simply amping up your stats instead of improving your skill. But Dark Souls difficulty is incredibly malleable. You can farm souls and level up stats to make your character stronger. You can switch your weapon or armor to tune up your playstyle. My decision to improve my gear didn't feel like I was being exploitative of the game's world, like I was taking the easy way out and losing out on what the game has to offer. That's a powerful move for Dark Souls to make. It constantly offers solutions and outlets to take on tough enemies that feel respectful instead of patronizing. It's such a cordial design gesture that I haven't seen in many other games. As a result of my improved gear, I was able to take on the Bell Gargoyles without much trouble, and after ringing the bell, I meandered around looking for the next path to take. In my wanderlust, I discovered one of the entrances to Blight Town, an area filled to the brim with buff, poisonous enemies and toxic spear-shooting snipers. To no one's surprise, I succumbed to the noxious atmosphere, even after equipping some improved gear from a lying asshole. But it was then that I realized just how lost I was, eventually considering the entrance to the alleyways of the Undead Burg. It may sound weird, but I was actually incredibly pleased to discover another path to take, revealing to me that Dark Souls is so open in where it expects the player to go. Light Town was an option, but it wasn't the only option, absolutely not. There was a whole other way to go, and, to my ignorance at the time, one of many. After a desperate dash to the bonfire to up my level after the Capra Demon, I dove into the depths of the Burg, which was the first time where I really felt Dark Souls' world pressing down on me. The limited visibility was already a big issue, but the winding paths and swarms of enemies exemplified how unpredictable the depths were. Poisonous rats and curse-inducing basilisks made every step a test of my skill and foresight, leading up to an extremely memorable boss at the bottom of the region. The gaping dragon was able to stay in my mind for a long time simply because of its terrifying aesthetic direction. The seemingly endless rows of teeth in its maw show how good From Software are in enemy design. Though I do wish the boss was a bit more creative in how it attacks. Its sluggish and heavily telegraphed moves aren't hard to dodge, even in close quarters, leading to a very simple fight that still managed to get by on its incredible aesthetic design. 
I immediately used a homeward bone to get the hell back to a bonfire in the depths, which was a stark contrast to my actions after defeating the Capra demon, where I rushed through the alleyways again at very low health, desperately trying to get back to the bonfire without dying to the enemies that swarmed outside the fog wall. That's another part of the game's design that really stuck with me. You can always get more souls on the way back to the bonfire, but post-boss, you're filled to the brim with them. You're anxious to use them not just because they have a purpose in leveling up or upgrading gear, but because there's a chance you'll die and you lose them for good without reclaiming them. There's a subconscious fear of having something important taken away from you. I'm not a gambler, so I used the homeward bones when I could, but Dark Souls did push me beyond my comfort zone quite a few times, simply for the satisfaction of getting more souls and holding onto a homeward bone in the case it'd be better used later. It's another big risk-reward setup that's so tough to ignore. With the Blight Town key in hand, I made my way back to an area that annihilated me the first time around, but this time I had a much more manageable path to traverse. Blight Town was incredibly fascinating to me. The structures you traverse downward appeared rickety and damaged. The dim glow from your character heavily limits visibility. Even when on solid ground without an enemy in sight, I never felt like I was safe, and not just because of the toxic snipers that peppered the area out of view. Blight Town presented itself as a maze on its side, a downward labyrinth of platforms and scaffolding with items, enemies, and secrets abound. Even with the ladders directing you toward reprieve, it's rich with misdirection but rewards players who brave its strange layout. Of course, the challenge never dissipates, and the bottom area of Blighttown is dense with poisonous enemies and noxious swamp water. I do think this was a necessary attribute for this particular area, but once the player is able to avoid the rickety platforms above, the rest of the area didn't prove quite as difficult. Even the monsters tossing boulders didn't make me as anxious as simply wandering Blighttown's upper regions. The same can be said about Chaos Witch Quelog, who is an aesthetically interesting boss with a nice variety of attacks, but doesn't quite provide the anxiety that the player just experienced progressing downward through Blight Town. Persistent poison is much harder to handle than Quelog's moves, and it's a big part of the region in general, so it's kind of surprising that the poison element isn't a more significant part of Quelog's boss fight. Either way, it's a respectable way to cap off Blight Town's harrowing heights, making her a memorable boss in her own right. With a ring of the next bell, a new path opened its gate, Sen's Fortress. I want to get this out of the way first. Sen's Fortress is bullshit. From the precarious pathways, to the swinging blades, to the durable enemies, to the Indiana Jones rolling boulders, Sen's Fortress is one of the most mustache-twirlingly evil areas I've seen in any game ever. If the Bell Gargoyle 1-2 Punch was totally demanding of the player's resolve, Sen's Fortress feels like the machinations of a level designer with a personal grudge against the player. It's so cheap, it's so difficult, but I can't help but be impressed. Incredibly impressed. The entire stage is constructed in an overtly calculated and planned way. A gauntlet crafted to seem like it's from the mind of a devious supervillain. Pushing through its maddening hazards and brilliant enemy layouts, I sighed an enormous sigh of relief, even managing to get close to the Iron Golem boss. Sen's Fortress is an abusive relationship in level design form, if anything because of its shamelessness. It's supposed to be difficult, cheap, and utter bullshit in any regard, and expecting the player to overcome odds so stacked against them is a gesture of true respect. There's only so much that grinding and leveling up can do. Eventually, you just need to grate your teeth and press onward. While Sen's Fortress is not anywhere near one of my favorite of Dark Souls' many environments, it's definitely the one that I respect the most. And that bonfire off the sidewall is probably my biggest are you kidding me moment in this whole damn game. After a quick flight, I made it to the picturesque An Orlando. The region makes a pretty wonderful first impression, but with a heavy collection of souls, I made a mad dash to the first bonfire I could find and leveled up a bit. In my meandering, I made it to another gargoyle, something I didn't expect to find again, let alone so soon. There's a strong sense of satisfaction seeing what was originally a major boss, now treated like a lower tier enemy. This is another great way to show player growth, an empowering method where they're able to take on a challenge that proves so much more difficult than before. Many great games have done this in the past, but Dark Souls' tasteful reuse of boss enemies is a reflection of the player's arduous journey thus far. In my own narrative throughout the game, it stood out considerably, and I honestly was pleased to see boss enemies reappear when I'm strong and skilled enough to make mincemeat of them. They're fantastic to see. Though I can't say the same for the ghastly mimic chests, which got me for the first time in An Orlando. Not much to say about these tricksters, but I can appreciate forcing the player to tread lightly even when scooping up rewards. 
After wandering around for an hour or two having no clue where to go, I did some scouting around other areas to see, and lo and behold, there existed a path beyond the blacksmith. The mini-boss that stood in my way had intimidated me to the core before, but with newfound strength, it fell and the eerie but kind of beautiful Darkroot Garden was open for exploration. I really do like Darkroot Garden, despite the humanoid tree enemies having an exhaustively large hit range. In contrast to the aging city ruins of the Burg or the shimmering spires of An Orlando, I appreciate the naturalistic forests of Darkroot Garden a lot. They're good at concealing enemies, especially in the more spacious sections, but they just felt a bit out of place in Dark Souls castles and more man-made areas. They're a great change of pace that stuck with me on my way to the Moonlight Butterfly boss. Interestingly enough, this boss was an absolute pushover because I hadn't explored this area at all till now, but it really made my melee build into its own obstacle. Dodging projectiles was tough, leaving me desperately waiting for the boss to land so I could wipe it out with my lance. One thing that especially stood out was the gentle and peaceful mood that the boss emitted, mostly thanks to its wafting, elegant movement patterns and the absolutely superb music theme that plays throughout the fight. Take a quick listen. In the heat of a tough boss battle, Dark Souls tends to drive the player's focus toward the task at hand, so those little aesthetic details might go overlooked when you're frantically defending against attacks. The Moonlight Butterfly definitely threw that idea on its head, giving me a chance to bask in the beauty of its design while keeping its music theme prominent without being too in your face. While I was panicking, simply trying to stay alive when fighting the Bell Gargoyles, the Moonlight Butterfly was almost mystifying, and its much more patient design was a striking change of pace when compared to other fights up till then. The Darkroot Garden's tantalizing atmosphere led me to continue exploring it, using the Crest of Artorias I received from the blacksmith to open a new region of the area. The Forested Grove was, as I mentioned, fantastic at concealing enemies, leading to some sneak attacks that sent me back to the bonfire several times. Unpredictable in every sense, the garden is one of my favorites of the game, with plenty of enemy types, intelligent layouts of ambushes, and even an NPC that caught me off guard when I first located them. But the clouded wall that's so clearly visible in the distance immediately grabbed my attention, pulling me towards several enemy clusters and leading up to what's probably my favorite boss fight in the game, Great Grey Wolf Sif. The design of a wolf holding a sword in their teeth and attacking with it doesn't seem too over the top, but the animations were incredibly well done, and it's still crystal clear how From Software can take a simple idea and make it memorable. Sif is not an easy boss fight, at least not at the level I was at, so bashing a nearby illusory wall concealing a closer bonfire was a pleasant surprise, preceded by helpful messages that notified me of a secret that could make the game less punishing. And yes, punishing is the operative word. Dark Souls is often cited as a difficult game, yes, but the frustration didn't usually come from insurmountable odds. The agony was being forced to slowly walk a long ways back to the place that got me, waiting on an elevator or trucking along a narrow pathways. That's punishment. The sooner anyone can get back into the action, the better, and the sting of defeat is all the more intense when the punishment of waiting or trudging back is severe. That's something that I like to imagine the developers understood, as they clearly want the player to prove their worth to themselves. It's a respectful relationship, even if it's rough at times. And that sense of respect is translated into how the notes and community features work. There's a positive circuit of communication in Dark Souls' message system. Maybe I simply got lucky here, but the get good attitude that had become almost inseparable from the Soulsborne discourse ended up being kind of a myth. Sure, there are people online who would attribute any kind of problem with Dark Souls to a player's inexperience or lack of skill, but I encountered both developer messages and notes from hostility-free players that were willing to guide me through the world. I still had to keep my guard up for any misleading messages, of course, but I still feel like my time in Dark Souls lacked any kind of external pressure from its community, at least in the game. It was liberating to say the least, being able to take on tough challenges fully in the know that they can be done. That gesture of telling a player of a bonfire that's so much closer than the last is proof of it all. Sure, I might have been able to find it on my own, but discovering it through a message hint really solidified why this system is beneficial. The community as a whole has flourished, but unless I actually played the game myself, this would have just been hollow hearsay. What I experienced instead was the same kind of benevolence that you'd expect from a group of friends, those who are in the know of the game's quirks, and willing to share them to you. I know this isn't limited to Dark Souls, but for a game with such a notorious reputation, I gotta say that it stuck with me long after Sif's tragic defeat. 
And really, I needed that community push, because I don't think I would have made it further in Anorlando if I didn't receive it. After making my way back to the top of Sen's fortress to head back, I read a message signifying me to traverse these narrow paths into one of the buildings. This felt like some kind of exploit, and I don't think it was communicated as well as it could have been. If this was some kind of secret area, then I could buy it, but as a way to progress further in Anne Orlando, it lacked the subtle clarity and intuitive clues that Dark Souls, up till then anyway, had really perfected. The enemies on the rafters above were even worse, and though a harrowing battle precariously staged above a dangerous drop does seem stereotypically Dark Souls, it did seem more obtuse than preferred. I can judge it based on my own lack of intuitiveness, but regardless of who you blame, it ended up being one of my least favorite setups in the entire game. It just didn't click. It didn't help that this sequence ultimately gave me access to Anne Orlando's rooftop pads, whose distant snipers and spear-wielding enemies made this into an even bigger ordeal. My time spent in this city was mostly around here, leading me to believe that the developer's trust in me was misplaced. I couldn't help but compare the attitude I deciphered from this to something like Sen's Fortress. While Sen's Fortress appeared almost cartoonish in its villainous layout, leading to what honestly felt like a twisted comedy at the player's own expense, the rooftops of Anne Orlando seem more deliberate in the desire to exhaust explorative players. The enemy placement was sterner and even less forgiving, requiring some nimble footwork and a bit of luck too, which is odd because it's shorter and less busy than Sen's Fortress. The constant fear of plummeting off an edge was draining, so it was difficult to appreciate this section in the same way. The sincerity that helped me persevere through Sen's Fortress just wasn't as apparent here. Though I will say that the interior of Anne Orlando cooled things down considerably, making its confrontations much more manageable. Between nights and even a battle against a mimic, the challenge was definitely there for me. Digestible in chunks without being too forgiving. It settled my nerves well, let me catch my breath, prior to... Um... Well. Anne Orlando's tag team duo of a boss encounter is a real spike in difficulty. One that I absolutely wasn't prepared for. The Bell Gargoyles had already displayed boss fights against multiple enemies, but with Ornstein and Smo having such immensely different fighting styles, this fight caught me off guard in nearly every way. This is a situation where you're frantically keeping the plate spinning, avoiding Ornstein's fast dash attacks and lightning bolts, while Smo swings their hammer and plows across the battlefield. The whole big enemy, small enemy dynamic of boss fights isn't new to games, but even just one of these brawlers would be a viable challenge to a new player like myself. This was probably the hardest boss fight I experienced in the game, and the way From Software were able to make this dynamic so cohesive shows a ton of skill at the craft. I definitely had my share of failures against Ornstein and Smo, but something tells me that this was a boss fight that needed to happen. A way to really cripple the player's resolve and put them in their place. Sure, I could have very well had spent my time grinding for souls and levels, but was that really what I wanted to do? No, I didn't. Stubbornly, I pushed forward and kept fighting with what I had, banging my head against the wall until it eventually collapsed. To some, this might be the true appeal of the series, repeatedly getting knocked down and getting back up again, and for a split second, that was all that mattered to me. Maybe Dark Souls really is a true test of the stubborn like myself, but defeating Ornstein and Smo was the tipping point. After ultimately reaching Guinevere and obtaining the fabled Lord Vessel, I was totally in it. I didn't want to stop playing Dark Souls, not until reaching the end. I delivered the Lord Vessel to the altar, opening up additional regions of the world, and fully establishing my drive to actually finish Dark Souls. There was no turning back. The first location I visited was the Duke's Archives, just a bit outside of Anne Orlando. There wasn't much to this region at first. Some sporadically placed enemies, a few stairways to higher levels, nothing that surprised me. Until I got to Seath the Scaleless at the top of the building. This was a kick in the pants, because I just mentioned earlier how stubborn I was when fighting Ornstein and Smo, how much I just wanted to keep playing and eventually beat the boss. Seath's fight was a wake-up call, an affirmation that stubbornness is just as punishable as any other mistake in play. I couldn't beat Seath. They threw me into the jail cell time and time again, and as I dashed back to the battle from the bonfire, I lost every time, totally oblivious to the fact that death is an inevitability here. As tough as Dark Souls is, this battle with Seath shows that you can't rely on combat skills alone to get through this game. Exploration is a part of this game's appeal too. Getting good isn't the only ingredient to this recipe. The repeated failure of Seath's fight is that reminder, lateral thinking can be an even greater weapon. So yeah, eventually it clicked. 
I was doing it all wrong. I made my way to the secret passage in the archives and found a small forest grove leading to the glittering prize of the Crystal Cave, which was the way to the real Seath boss fight. The invisible pathways toward the fight where you need to eye the falling crystals and detect where they impact the path were really cool. Easily one of the best navigational puzzles in the whole game. It showed the genius utility of the hint messages as, once again, I was successfully pushed to safety by the benevolence of another human being. Eventually reaching Seath and in full preparation to get revenge on this obtusely designed boss encounter, the fight itself was pretty typical, though the curse effect was a nice way to keep players like me on their toes. Having been cursed once before, I didn't want it to happen again, so I was able to make quick work of Seath before warping back to Firelink for a much needed rest. My next path sent me back down to Blight Town and eventually toward the Demon Ruins, which I'd argue is one of the least compelling sections of the game. The region lacks a ton of nuance and memorability, though seeing Capra and Taurus Demons guarding later sections was another great use of former boss creatures to pepper more difficult sections, once again putting the player's progress in perspective. The Ceaseless Discharge, Demon Fire Sage, and Centipede Demon boss fights were fine enough on a mechanical level, but lacked a ton of memorability, both in aesthetics and attack patterns. After such a hugely memorable fight with Ornstein and Smo, and with my own playthrough already encountering Sif, these slower, less dynamic fights just blurred together. The stale environment direction also rubbed me the wrong way, because while Demonic Ruins should logically have some Hellfire involved, there isn't much that really sticks with the player as they run across pools of fiery lava. It's not until I got to the next major choke point that anything in the Demon Ruins or Lost Isolith became worth remembering for me. I've heard from some that the Bed of Chaos is, quote, the biggest failure in an otherwise flawless game. And whether or not you think any of that claim is true, it showed me that the implementation of a gimmick is very important when constructing a boss fight. It's one thing to drive the player to think differently when approaching a challenge, but collapsing floors and isolated weak points just didn't exemplify why Dark Souls bosses are so memorable to me at that point. The Bed of Chaos isn't removing any kind of established crutch, so its difficulty comes from an unnatural place, one that didn't mesh properly with the game's appeal. I love the aesthetic design of this boss though, with the winding, fiery branches, so it's all the more tragic that its platforming gimmick is so mishandled. It's an awkward cap off for an arc that never really landed. Hightailing it back to Firelink Shrine, my next stop was the Catacombs to find Nito, the boss that peppered meme after meme on the internet. The Catacombs entrance is another standout example of Dark Souls' playfulness. It's in the graveyard located close to Firelink Shrine, but it's guarded by regenerating skeleton enemies. This is very interesting to me, seeing a collection of difficult-to-kill enemies in an area so close to the main hub. In a way, it's a beginner's trap, discouraging the player from any progression until they can find a way to destroy the skeletons. In fact, it was a beginner's trap for me, as my initial trial run in Dark Souls, long before giving it this much attention, drove me to simply ignore that area and try a different route instead. Only in this long playthrough did I eventually understand the trick to killing these skeletons for good, so I grabbed a divine club and started to just beat the shit out of them. The Catacombs is another area whose limited visibility kept me on edge, punctuated with faster wheel skeleton enemies and a boss fight with Pinwheel that, while very easy to beat at the level I was at, caught me off guard after a long gauntlet of enemy encounters. The Catacombs was another very memorable area in Dark Souls, as its gloomy, decrepit environments and devious positioning of traps and enemies gave it a unique flavor that no other region managed to nail. Little did I know what was next, though. The Tomb of the Giants is terrifying. It pretty much had everything I could ever not want in a Dark Souls area. Extremely limited visibility, enormous and menacing enemies that do plenty of damage, and a general lack of assurance of where I'm actually supposed to go. As I tiptoed across the region, following the faint lights into what could easily be a giant skeleton enemy, glowing eyes in the darkness and all, I was absolutely breathless when I managed to grab the Skull Lantern and could actually see what was going on. Even more of a relief was finding a guarded bonfire in the darkness, making my trek from the catacombs all the shorter. The Tomb of the Giants, for me anyway, was Dark Souls kicking out every crutch I possibly had left. It's the most oppressive environment I've seen in any game I've played, but once again, it's almost comical in how much Dark Souls wants the player to struggle. At this point, I wasn't entirely sure that this was the devs having faith in the player, because if it was, that's a level of malformed benevolence that's simply unheard of. The massive crawling skeletons still haunt my dreams, I swear. But it very well could be faith. I got this far on adrenaline and personal spite alone, so seeing this level of oppression in its design could have been another case of Dark Souls just being Dark Souls. 
Maybe I had grown totally numb to the game's bullshit, but whatever was fueling my progress, I waited with bated breath through what was easily a highlight of my experience. It was proving that there are still ways to make the game tougher. And Gravelord Nito was another memorable entity in the game's massive boss brigade. While Pinwheel didn't do much for me back in the catacombs, I found Nito to be a massive improvement over all of the bosses in the Demon Ruins and Isolith combined. Nito could easily have been a solid boss on their own, but the reforming skeleton warriors only made things even more of an ordeal, and limited visibility had proven time and time again to be an obstacle. But after such an incredibly foreboding trek through the dark tunnels of the catacombs and Tomb of the Giants, I was ready to put a stake in it and get the hell back to Firelink. Fortunately, that's exactly what happened, leaving a single area left to tackle before opening the altar door. New Londo Ruins. I had actually made it to New Londo Ruins before after I got cursed in the depths, but immediately left after getting swarmed by spawning ghosts. Though my journey was cut short back then, the transient curse items nearby let me fight the specters that attacked me. New Londo Ruins is... okay. It didn't really have the character of Darkroot Garden or even the catacombs, but it was a pretty solid area with the same excellent enemy layouts that I had grown to expect from Dark Souls. I will say that the trick to entering the Abyss to fight the Four Kings is pretty ingenious, especially since it had been a long, long time since I obtained the Artorius Ring from Sif. The Four Kings fight on its own was tricky as well, the whole walking on nothing was a visual trick that I've always appreciated seeing in games while the spawn-ins from other targets made the fight a textbook case in time attack pressure. It's a challenging fight, even better than Nito, while also providing some cool visual spectacle despite taking place in a literal abyss. With the Lord Vessel filled with boss souls, it was time for the final test at the Kiln of the First Flame. Before I even managed to reach an enemy, I was awestruck at the environment design of this area, the brightly lit passage revealing an ash-covered earth, with the kiln structure glowing in the sunlight. It's simply gorgeous, a fantastic way to show the ultimacy of it all. Any great final boss needs to have that sense of finality that makes everything up till now reasserted in perspective. That first sight of the kiln, the nights peppered throughout the region, all leading up to a fog wall hiding the boss, Gwyn, Lord of Cinder. This was the end. As I passed through the fog wall and into the fight, I heard the gentle piano theme start up and fell in love. This quiet, subdued piece was such a change from the epic choral bombast of a fight like Four Kings. Even the Moonlight Butterfly's boss theme didn't have the choked up solitude that Gwyn's theme does. It's impossible to overstate. This is how you cap off a game like this. It almost felt somber to me, like the game knew how I was feeling after pouring dozens of hours into this monumental journey. The end of any trek has its melancholy when it reaches the final moments, and Dark Souls' tack toward the player is unreal here. It's a clear connection, even after this long, when it's over, it's over. And it was time to settle things. Gwyn's fight is not some giant abomination or elegant celestial beauty. It's a simple equation, a one-on-one -on -one fight between two very similar figures. These types of fights have fascinated me for a long time because they contradict the cinematic elements that you'd expect from a final boss. There's no cataclysmic backdrop or anything like that. Just solitude, just two people fighting each other until one loses. This really stuck with me, even considering that the fight itself wasn't crazy difficult. Despite his high attack range and quick speed, Gwyn didn't really punish me playing defensively. I was able to dodge certain attacks and get some quick pokes in over and over, and I never really got penalized for it. So while I can absolutely appreciate the sum of this fight's parts, I don't feel like I struggled with Gwyn as much as other bosses, which is a bit of a shame. Dark Souls originally came out in 2011. I don't mean to make anyone feel old by saying that, but it says a lot that a game from more than 10 years ago is still treated with such massive reverence by so many people. Some say it's one of the best, if not the best, game ever made. It's a masterpiece in every way. Do I agree? Not entirely. It has flaws, clear and present ones, but they're flaws that, in some bizarre way, demonstrate creative poise and resilience. There's a mentality in Dark Souls of rolling with the punches and eventually finding the flow to overcome what would otherwise be insurmountable odds. It asks for a lot, more than I think many people are willing to give. Dark Souls really is an act of trust, of respect. It's Miyazaki and From Software placing the player against a challenge so megalithic that any sane person would say, not a chance. But the devs trust the player even more than the player trusts themselves, and 
I believe that level of respect should be reciprocated. Dark Souls is a game I can't help but respect. The surprise second bell gargoyle, the traps and enemy layouts of Sen's fortress, the demanding nature of Ornstein and Smo's fight, the obtuse challenge to fight Seath a second time, the absolute punishment of the Tomb of the Giants. I can name off so, so many moments throughout Dark Souls where I was staring defeat straight in the face, begging on my knees for some sense of relief. But the message of Dark Souls is everywhere, and despite what the internet might say, that message is not, get good. The message is, you can do this. It's not a demand or even advice. It's a gesture of encouragement, an assertion that this game, as hard as it is, is surmountable, that you can win. With the kiln of the first flame behind me, I know there's a lot left to see in this game. Areas I missed, builds to experiment with, a new game plus to take on. My journey with Dark Souls isn't entirely over, because I can clearly see myself returning to Firelink at some point. But in this reflection, the experience of a first time playthrough, being able to see those ending credits after so long is something very special. It might sound like boasting, but I did finish Dark Souls. I experienced a lot of really incredible things from the Asylum to the First Flame, and I would say that this playthrough has changed how I look at games as a whole. I now see how Dark Souls earned its glowing reception, and I don't believe that will ever be forgotten.